When you come to Prague today, there are many things to do, including a fairly vibrant English language theater scene. However, that has not always been the case. Anyone who's been here a long time has seen this scene grow and change over the years into what it is today. One of those people is a true long-timer, Mr. David Fisher, actor, EFL teacher, and artistic director and founder of the Bear Educational Theater. We're going to talk about the evolution of English language theater here in Prague today. Hi, David. Thanks for talking to me. Hello, David. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. And thank you, everybody out there for listening. Remember, you can always subscribe to this podcast. And if you like what we do, feel free to donate via our Buy Me a Coffee page. A city is much more than just a collection of buildings. It's a location, it's a history, it's a culture, it's ideas and ideals, and a city is also, most importantly, the people in it. This is Prague Times, the podcast that takes a look at the city of Prague in the Czech Republic. With more than a thousand years of history, there's a lot to talk about. We'll talk about the past of Prague, but we'll also talk about the city as it is today, future plans for the city, and much more. It's Prague then, Prague now, and Prague later. And this is Prague Times. So, David, you are um, quite well known in the English language theater scene here, I think. Yeah, most of what I do is educational theater, which Mm -hmm. means most of what I do is in schools, though. So I'm not sure it's so surprised if I am well known because I, I really live in my own little world and I feel that uh, I kind of come out into the English language theatre scene every now and again just to say hello and stay in touch with people and I'm, I'm always quite surprised when people say, oh yeah, we know who you are. So you first came here way back when, 1990, I believe you told it me. It was February 1990, February the 5th, 1990 was the first time I ever came to Yes, that's, a, that's when the plane landed. So, uh, what what made you come here? Uh, uh, well, first time, um, I mean, I came, I came here after, straight after university. Mm-hmm. Not, not quite true. I finished university. I studied philosophy. Mm. And so, I had no career. Um, I, I'm, you can teach or just be depressed. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Or, yeah, or just drink. Or, <laughs> or, or remain stoned was the option at that time. So, I thought, <laughs> I'd, I'd done a bit of that. So, I thought, oh, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll try and make a living. And no, uh, but it, somehow I, I, I took a very short teaching qualification and I've always felt very attached to teaching, the idea mm. of teaching, not specifically, but both of my parents were teachers. Mm. And so I took a very quick language requalification course. Of course, like teaching ELT, many people just take that on as a way to travel and that right. was my main thing. But as soon as I did it, I just felt so comfortable you said, teaching. this is it, this is what I want to do. This is who I am, huh? simply, yeah. And I, really, I, and I still feel that today. I, I really feel I am a... Uh, just a teacher that's, that's really feels my and I think teachers have this instinct that any anytime anything interesting happens to me I just want to tell other people about it or right other, you know that's that, and it just feels very much who I am so mm-hmm. some of the best teachers because I've been a teacher for many many years also some of the best ones are ultimately in love with stories and with mm-hmm. narratives and you know helping other people tell their stories communicating different stories and narratives and ideas to other people uh things like that so te- teaching and theater seem like a kind of a natural match well yeah they are <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly i was always interested in theater more like as a hobby i used to go to theaters without mm-hmm. ever having any intention of being an actor mm-hmm. or being actively involved in theater mm-hmm. um but i used to go compulsively to stratford upon avon to the royal shakespeare company mm-hmm. again and again i don't even know what was put now now it seems clear what was pulling me there because now i've been doing shakespeare and playing right. professional shakespeare years later mm-hmm. um drawing on all of that experience but i really yeah i don't know what made me want to do it but doing theater going to theaters and I feel very natural as a teacher and we'll probably get to this a bit later but it, it felt very natural when I combined theater with teaching sure which is very much the water I swim in now it's like mm. how drama and theater can help people learn and help the educational process and help make learning fun mm. but it's very much what you said I'm, I'm and it's true I'm very fixated on stories mm-hmm. even as an actor as a theater practitioner 
And I get frustrated with um, theatre and film. Films are very visual media, and I'm not very interested in it. I'm not a mm. visual person. I'm very, very story focused. So you can take me to a great show with great dancing and costumes and a wonderful set. And if they aren't telling the story well, right. I'm just, well, what was that about? You're not really into the spectacle. You're more of a my dinner with Andre kind of a guy. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and the theatre, we I mean, the, the Bear Educational Theatre, it's about telling stories. Mm -hmm. The story, you just said the right word, it's telling stories. Mm -hmm. So back in the early 90s, you were involved in Misery Loves Company, which was, I believe, the first of the English language theater groups here in Prague. It was, certainly, yes, in Prague. I mean, I wasn't involved. I was really on the fringes of mm -hmm. it. I was more volunteering and happy to be around it. And um, Groupie. A group, I was a groupie. <laughs> that, that's pretty much all I was. I don't know how useful my contributions were in reality, but <laughs> but it was it was very nice to be around professional people, people who understood theatre, were able to make theatre. Um, yeah, there was Richard Toth, who was mm -hmm. uh, a clown. He was a professional clown who had come out of a circus, and he settled in Prague. And David Nichol, who is now... Uh, they, he went back to Canada, but he's a very well-established actor, professional actor now. Mm. And so the two of them got together and started putting up shows. And like now, there, was a number of, there were a number of people in town who were, either had been professional actors or who were just very capable, competent actors. Right, right, right. So then you were involved with them, kind of, sort of, and then Black Box, which Beth Russell and then later Nancy Bishop took over. Yes, exactly. Nancy Bishop came to town and um, and I actually did one black box show. And it was kind of my early days as an actor. So in Misery Loves Company, I never got on the stage. I wasn't, I, I did some other amateur projects around, but I was never good enough to be on the stage. There. And black box was my first time being. So that in was a, your debut? A kind of my semi professional ish kind of as mm -hmm. much as anything is in this mm -hmm. town debut, yes. Right. So you're doing all this in the in the first half of the 90s, basically, mm. and then comes the mid-90s, and you get a chance to do Chekhov's The Bear. That's when The Bear started, yes. Mm -hmm. So so basically, I've been on the fringes. I've been kind of doing amateur theatre, and I still was a very much an amateur actor in my mind. But yeah, so I really wanted a chance, though, to, to be able to play a bigger part, to mm. do it more times. Because I am a teacher, I... I, I immediately knew I'd, I'd, I'd like the model of doing drama and education, doing theatre for students. Mm -hmm. So I got David Nichol, or he volunteered, um, of Misery Loves Company to direct me acting Smirnov, the main character in the play The Bear by Anton Chekhov, mm -hmm. which is a, a short, it's about, runs to about 40 minutes, I think mm -hmm. 40, 50 minutes. I created teaching materials to go with that because I was always intending to be able to play it in schools. And aimed at EFL students? students or at children or both? EFL students in state schools, yes. So, uh -huh. so I basically marketed it to secondary schools and that was the beginning of the Bear Educational Theatre. Ah. And um, in those days we had, um, I mean, I didn't have any connections in the schools. I just knew that I wanted to play the show mm. more for selfish reasons because I just wanted to play that part 20 times mm -hmm. and just have the experience of getting better as an actor by doing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And so I just went through the phone book and phoned schools out of the old phone book like they had back in those days in 1996. That's and because funny. three out of the first 10 schools that I phoned were interested because there was nothing like that around at all, that gave me the, the confidence to, to carry on. You were like, cool, I don't even have to keep calling. I've got work. <laughs> there were no real native speaker programs as such. So they were just very happy to have a native speaker in their school for mm -hmm. one hour. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just wanted to play the show, really. So mm -hmm. we just needed to cover costs. And, and no, so that was it. So we played probably about 20 or 30 times we played the bear on that. And it was, they were schools session. all around Prague? or Yeah, I think the furthest we went at that time was Pardubice, which is mm -hmm. like an hour by train. We stayed on the main, we didn't have a car at that time. So we were just taking everything on the trains, all the props and the, the couple of suitcases and the yeah the backdrop and everything. You take over the whole compartment, right? <laughs> yeah. No, even yeah. No, not even that. We've always traveled. The bears always traveled very light. Mm -hmm. I, I don't believe in I don't, I don't believe in scenery. I don't believe in. Uh, we got costumes Lighting. and a curtain. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. I don't believe in rehearsal. That's another. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
And um, yeah, so basically it was a backpack. We had our shows in a backpack on a train. After that run was over, what, when you basically ran out of interested schools, then what? Then I decided I wanted to do another show, so I, right. I joined... Um, that was a success. It, it worked well enough for me. I got to play the show more times, and the, right. they were happy. Uh, that, that's the thing. It was a selfish motivation, but I really... Obviously, I, I am a teacher, and I don't... I, I will teach well, and I don't want to just do, do things. And that's actually what puts me off theatre today. I, I find theatre is a very self-interested thing when you get to especially professional theatre. So, And that's why I'm a lot happier doing my educational theatre. It's about really trying to give a product that's for somebody, it's for something, it's mm-hmm. helping the audience to achieve something. Whereas most professional theatre, uh, it's very much, look at me, I'm extraordinary, you will enjoy watching me. A lot of friends who are performers who right. who I'm trying not to offend here too personally. We don't mean you guys. No, we mean it's, all the other ones. It's yeah, all exactly. the other ones. It's the other ones, the, you know, the, the, yeah, the self-centred ones, not you. Even though I was aware, I actually was doing it for selfish motivations. I really did want to learn more about acting. Mm-hmm. 25 years later, the bear is still around, still doing stuff, and you guys even don't perform in Prague really anymore. You're almost entirely a traveling outfit. Before the COVID situation, of course, so that's, mm-hmm. that's uh, caused some changes, which, which have been interesting as well. But we play in the Reduta Theatre in the center of Prague, oh, okay, yeah. and we play there a couple of times a week. But before the COVID started, we'd, um, let's say four years ago, I had like three teams out most days. Mm -hmm. So we'd be playing seven, eight hundred shows a year. Good Lord. And you're going all over Europe. You're going to France and Poland and yeah. Hungary. Mostly Fr- mostly Poland and France now. But we did. And for a while, we, yeah, we're going to Hungary uh, a lot. Hungary and Austria. Mostly the, the neighboring countries. We even went to England. I play in the summer for language schools in England. Then we got a very good accountant who explained to us that the European Union does not mean you can actually play in any country you like. <laughs> So you actually are meant to register for taxes in those countries. And I said, oh, I didn't know that. Whoops. So, <laughs> whoops exactly. so now we only play in Poland and France where ah. we, we are allowed to because we found out that it's easier to do that and we can do it legally. So getting a good accountant was key to reducing uh, our range. And it's always in English. And it's always in English. We'll play, um, it depends, we, we play for all over. I mean, we've got a repertoire now. If I needed to play, I think, 24 different shows, I could. We've, we have played them or we have the props uh, somewhere. And because, again, you're still traveling light, I'm sure it's more than a backpack now, but still, what, two backpacks, three backpacks? It, it's two, two suitcases is uh-huh. the max. The Christmas Carol actually has two suitcases and four bags. So that's your that's your giant... That's the big that's one. That's your Starlight Express. And it's got four actors in it, which is extreme. Wow! Yeah. So pretty much two actors per show, three actors, two or three actors per show. And we'll go on tour in a car with three actors and maybe seven suitcases crammed into an estate car. Mm. And we'll do a tour and play five different shows. Those three actors can play five different shows. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, and we'll play for young and old. To get back to the question you asked a few minutes ago, we'll put in bits of the local language if we're playing for young audience. So if we're playing for youngsters, Mm. there's Jackie and the Giant is the most popular show, for example, for Total Beginners. Jackie is a girl of that country who speaks that language, Uh, who needs the children to help her speak English to the giant. Oh, that's great. Now, if we don't have somebody of that country if we're traveling will do it all in English but that's the dynamic the the teaching dynamic of that show and how do you choose which plays to perform I wrote them I've created the plays Mm. I mean my my conception of what the 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 plays are for the Bear Educational Theatre it's 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 the perfect English lesson Mm. it's the most entertaining and effective English lesson you could ever want Mm. And that's how I conceive a, a show. So I've, I've written the show specifically for the age range. Right. Um, I mean, a lot of them have specific English teaching aims. We've got the case of the present perfect. Oh, right. For example, uh-huh. where Frank Novotny solves the... Somebody steals earrings and he uses the present perfect to solve it. And the, uh-huh, and the uh-huh. audience has to work it out. And, ah, that's cool. So yeah, it could, so could be a grammar focus, could be pronunciation, could be uh, It could be different vocabulary. things. Vocabulary. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, and up to quite recently, um, I really almost conceived the, the, the repertoire of the bear as a, a textbook covering different mm-hmm. areas of grammar, vocabulary, areas that you would find in a textbook on stage Mm. the idea being that if a teacher is working on the present perfect which they all are for years and years they bring their class to see it and it's 
they're supported, directly supporting their English teaching efforts, and that's how the theatre was conceived. It's a, a, a support for English language teachers. It's a, a teaching tool. How do you determine uh, sort of what's, you know, uh, beginner versus intermediate versus whatever? Because in the old days, when, mm. when I first started teaching back in the 90s, a lot of it was based around verb tenses, as they call them, though technically... They aren't all tenses. Some of them are aspects mm. and some of them are voices and all this. Mm. But, you know, in more recent thinking, people are using uh, corpus linguistics and things like this to look at word frequency and yes. starting to write textbooks based around this concept. Yes. Maybe maybe the grammar should come naturally and we should be focusing on the most frequent words used in English and this yes. and this. Do you adapt any of that into the writing or do you sometimes go back to an old piece and rewrite it in a different way? No, maybe I should. I'm a lot more old school with mm. that and that's the way I used to teach when I was teaching and that's I, I'm, I'm a bit stuck there. But, but the main thing also is, it's actually a very interesting question and I, I get caught out with this a bit with teachers sometimes, is that the shows we have really work for the level of student and the level of English. Mm -hmm. A lot of things I've discovered recently about why teachers take students to the theatre. At the end of the day, it's not, even for our theatre, it's not for the English now, there's two questions, why, why I do the theatre and what I think is the function of my theatre oh. in the educational world and how teachers perceive it, which is a lot more limited, I've come to realise recently. For me, the main function of the shows, it's motivational. And when I'm writing now and even doing workshops with teachers, I, I think the main value of theatre in education isn't specifically to teach for... It, it does. It, in back, I'm, now, I'm doing it grammar-based. Anytime you learn something, you have to learn it six times for it to sink in. Right. So I perceive what we're doing as one of those six times. Right, so a teacher right. can come and see the present perfect show. That's not. We're not going to teach anybody present perfect in 60 minutes. No. But we are part of a process. If that, you could figure that out, you would make a bundle. We'd be we'd be making more than we are, indeed. Yeah. But but beyond that, I, I think the real value of what theatre can offer educational processes, and especially the school system, which is very repressive by its nature, it's um, a lot more to do with just joy, bringing joy into the learning process again. And so the idea is that students come to the shows. And they just really do enjoy them. And they really enjoy them. And, and for me, ultimately, that's of a lot more value than us making sure we've used the right level of vocabulary in each show. Right. It's the, it's, it works on a lot simpler level than a lot more primitive level than that. Mm -hmm. is, is that the students who don't like it, and it's a lot more for them. I'm a lot more interested in technical students, the students who aren't language students. Right. Because the students who are language students, they're going to they're learn the language anyway. I mean, they don't need me to help them learn the language. They're, they're fine. What we do is a lot more valuable to the students who think they aren't good at English and aren't motivated to learn the mm -hmm. language because somehow the school has taught them that they're not good at English. Right, and because they, they have a and, rigid system for yeah. this is what constitutes success. I'm yeah. not good at those particular tasks. Exactly. I suck. Yeah, exactly. I yeah. didn't pass the test. I always get low thing. Right. But they can come and see the show and it's in English. Mm -hmm. Now, we will make sure that they will understand that show. So I'm pitching their nature so expressive and really enjoyable that's the thing mm -hmm. and they saw it it was in English and they had a really good time mm -hmm. and so that hopefully and that's all I can try to do is just to trigger that to make mm -hmm. them feel more positive about English and the fact that they can manage English to a certain degree right right and uh, I think the joy is a, a lovely meme came up on Facebook recently about the Muppets how the Muppets are no good at anything you probably saw that one going around nodding there uh, they're not actually good at anything right like they can't sing and they can't dance but they try and they love it. Yeah. They love it. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think for me, that's um, what's missing, of course, in the educational school, especially the public mm -hmm. school educational system, is the joy gets sucked out of subjects. Boy, that's for sure. And so I think the, the function of the Bear Educational Theatre to come into schools is to just re-inject a bit more of that joy back into mm -hmm. the language learning process and help people feel good about it. Kids are a great audience because they immediately let you know if they're in yeah. engaged because yes. they're 
all wide-eyed and making noise yeah, yeah. or if they're bored they're bored yeah. and you look out there and go oh jesus they don't yeah absolutely like absolutely yeah and it's taken i mean now we've been doing it for 25 years now so we've got a lot of fine tuning to work out so when i write a show now i i know it's going to work i know it's going to work i know what's not going to work mm -hmm. but um yeah for me and that's why doing the educational theater because i've done i do professional theater as well i have done evening shows i've done the shakespeare shows i've been in films and i don't value it at all the way that the to, to 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 play a show for a group of students sitting on a gym floor at 8 15 in the morning they're 13 years old you're doing it in a foreign language i mean how good does that have to be to get them excited <laughs> that's true pretty damn good and that's what? the answer yeah. whereas if you're playing in the evening what you've got you've got the lights you've got the wigs you've got the you've rehearsed it for god knows how long that's why i don't do it anymore because you just rehearse too long mm. And it's not difficult. It's easier to get away with doing educational theatre badly, maybe, because there's not the expectations right. placed on it. Yeah. But the skill set involved in doing it well, so mm. that it really, really works well, is a lot higher than what you're doing in any evening theatre, or even film I've worked on. I think the actors also are, they're not just focused on the performance or trying to make it realistic or what have you. Mm. Uh, they're also kind of gauging like a teacher does yeah you know you're always even as a teacher if you're like okay you know uh read this paragraph to yourself and then i'm gonna have you ask each other questions in pairs and you as a teacher are doing several things at once absolutely so the actors are doing the same thing it's like i'm acting and i'm trying to get this across but i'm also aware of the purpose of this particular show plus i'm gauging the audience to yeah. see what I need to adjust or not adjust. Exactly. And am I speaking too fast? Am I speaking right. too slowly? Am I patronizing them? Am right. I, well, what do I need to do? There's a hundred of them and like 30% yeah. of them understand me very well and 30% right. don't understand me at all. And yes, there's a lot more going on. When, when you play in the, the evening in the theater, you don't even see the audience. You've got lights in your eyes. Could be yeah. anybody. doesn't matter. But many things, you, there are many things you can do on a stage and acting is just one of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the problem I have with, with most classical actors is that all they can do is act. Mm -hmm. And they think that's all they should do. And they think right. that's the, the ultimate aim or that's the, the, the greatest thing you could ever do on a stage. Right. Yeah. But if you're doing this... Educational theatre, um, it was very nice talking to Gregory Gudgeon, who works with us mm -hmm. sometimes, though, who used to play in the Globe in London. Mm -hmm. And he has a similar thing where you get to see the audience and you get to look at them while you're playing. And like you say, you can see if they're bored, you can tell if they're with you or not. You can, mm -hmm. and, and the paying adult audience is also very easy to pay for because they're invested in, even if it's rubbish, they don't want to believe they, they've waited 500 crowns. <laughs> No, I mean they can see the worst show in the world. And they're going to say, "Oh, that was quite good." No, I was good. Well, well, well. Maybe I just don't like theater. No, you yeah. just didn't like that theater. Yeah, exactly. It was just like, no, it was fine. We got lights and wigs, and it was, that was, it was, it was great. It was great. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so it's 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 a lot more vibrant and it's a lot more real. And you really have to exactly you have to engage with the people you are looking at in front of you, and that's the challenge. That's why it's half teach it is teaching theatre. But but generally I, I find the skill set of a teacher is a lot more complex than the skill set of an actor. You know, right before I first moved here, back in the early 90s, I had this idea before I decided to pick up sticks and hightail it to central former communist Europe of using theatrical techniques, specifically acting training for like business managers, mm -hmm. you know, because I think, like you said, the skill sets overlap a lot. And so I always had this idea of you can use theater to learn how to do a bunch of other things, yeah. anything that involves engaging an audience. Yeah, any, anything with presentation, exactly. Mm -hmm. And engaging an audience, and that's the big thing, um, yeah, the overlap between theater and teaching and, and business as well. It's engaging is a very important word there. And uh, for teaching in theater, it's about creating an atmosphere in a room. Mm -hmm. And that's a skill that a, a good theater professional has. You can create a, a, a certain positive atmosphere in a room, mm -hmm. or it doesn't have to be positive, it could be the tragic, but whatever it is. If they could have those skills, mm -hmm. that is what a teacher is. It's this weird osmosis whereby teachers teach. Who knows how that really works? Mm. But creating an atmosphere in a room is, is a big part of it, creating a positive learning atmosphere. Yeah, I've always thought that the, uh, the, the best lessons that I've either uh, taught myself ahem, or that I've observed <laughs> have always created a sort of a focused, permissive atmosphere yeah. in which 
as I used to always tell my students, because here, especially in this country, the educational system, specifically when it comes to languages, and this is partly because Czech is so grammatically complicated, and so even younger students have these really mid-20th century attitudes towards language and language acquisition and how they're uh, evaluated and so on, and I would always tell them, this is the place to make the mistakes. Better here than when you're, you know, going into, I'm going to pick on Dallas, going into the airport at Dallas with an angry, underpaid TSA agent. Don't make your mistakes there. Make them here in this space. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great parallel, isn't it? And that's, what, and that's what rehearsal should be in a theater. It should mm -hmm. be the safe space where you, you're, allowed, you're meant to do it wrong. You're meant to be yeah, able make, to make, make mistakes. Make that mistake. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. I have noticed, you know, the, the old joke is that doctors make the worst patients. The worst students are fellow teachers. Right. Do you ever have to contend with that? Do you have people coming up to you after a show and going, oh, you know, I didn't like this, or this is wrong, or this is no, dumb? No, but I, it's taken me a long time to get comfortable with teacher training mm. for that reason. And I've been doing quite a lot of that more and more. And my sessions have generally gone well, but it was only until very recently I felt comfortable that I understood. Of course, like when I'm teacher training, I, I know that everybody in the room is actually a lot knows a lot more about the reality of teaching classes than I do because right. I'm not doing that. I'm, you're, I'm, you're the I'm, play guy. Yeah, I just, <laughs> I just breeze in. Everyone has a wonderful time and I breeze out again and that's, right. I just do that over and over again. I don't have to deal with the reality of making a relationship with those students mm -hmm. over the course of years and, and dealing with the authorities in the school and the whole thing and the administration. And yeah, I, I, I did, I've always felt a bit uncomfortable doing that, even though I felt very comfortable about what I had to say to them and the value of, of the work I'm doing and how it could help them. I've never felt, until recently, and now I do actually, even since the, since the pandemic actually helped a lot, meeting more teachers online. Mm -hmm. Now I feel a lot more comfortable about being with them and mm -hmm. being in that society. Or they have their own preconceptions, in, and that's true, because they've this been teaching always, yeah. for 30 years in a certain way, right. and you're suddenly saying, oh, actually, you should teach this way. They're like, no. They're like, why don't you piss right back off to... Prague, buddy. Yeah, exactly. What do you do? Yeah, I was say, easy for you to say. Exactly, you, Mr. Foreigner. And... So do you have like a circuit of schools that you return to again and again and again? Or are you always adding different schools? How do you find them? Do they find you? How does it, How does that work? Where we are at the moment is, because um, yeah, we've been doing this for like 25 years. Mm -hmm. Let's say the last 15 years, it kind of got up to a high level. Now, we've got lots of schools um, where we've been going for 10, 12, 15 years, mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. and again. We've actually got quite good long-term relationships. But it often happens we'll have a good relationship with one teacher who loves what we do, and then they retire, and then sometimes a new teacher will take over mm -hmm. and do the bookings, and sometimes you know what schools are like. There can be yeah. a lot of um, jealousy or a lot of whatever, mm -hmm. like negative relationships. So mm -hmm. some say, ah, great, she's gone. We don't have to have those stupid actors anymore. So that, mm -hmm. And I've been quite, not lazy, but I'll just tend to do a, a big mailing or I'll go to conferences. And I feel now we're at the stage of more reminding people that we're here. We're like Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't need to tell anybody about Coca-Cola, but they just right. need to remind people that maybe you could have one tomorrow kind of thing. Or, but having said that, I think there's a new generation group been around for so long there's actually a whole generation of young teachers and i'm meeting more and more people who have never heard of us and don't really know mm -hmm. what we are but fortunately now because of covid um we don't have a theater to to worry about too much so i can i, I don't need three teams a day to be busy I, i've got me and a few other people who are the, 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 the other unemployable people and the concept of educational theater like it, it actually is rather broad and the, the reason I bring this up is I'm reminded of something during the 2016 Prague Shakespeare Company season. During the 2016 season it was the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's birth so Guy Roberts the artistic director did every single Shakespeare play plus all the sonnets in some shape or form in a single year mm. and your wife did a really interesting thing I didn't get to see it but she did this sort of theater therapy version of Timon of Athens yes. that I talked to someone who participated well, in it. Well, there's only two said, people, so well done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well done finding and them. They, they said it was phenomenal. And that's, a, that's also, in its way, a kind of an educational theater experience, but as therapy. 
Well, it's something, yeah, something we'd like to do more. And I, I'm, I'm interested in doing a lot more workshop stuff with, uh, with students. So that, that's yeah, my wife, Lenka, who you know well as well. She's a great actress too, but she's a trained drama therapist. So she used some drama therapy-based techniques to lead people through. And, and I, I think well, I'd love to do that. I, I was thinking like before the Shakespeare productions, it would be lovely for her to do that kind of workshop with the actors. Cause it's a great way to get oh, people yeah. focused on the themes of the story mm -hmm. to get inside the skin of the main characters and what are they doing why what, what, yeah what's mm -hmm. what's going on in their minds i mean i did a little bit of this during the during the lockdown time there's actually something i'd like to do shakespeare saturdays maybe twice a month mm. and have like a three-hour session on a different shakespeare play mm. once or twice a month and i think that'd be a lovely thing if people would be willing to pay for it Ooh, that's very nice. If people would be willing to pay for it. If people would be willing to pay for that it. That would be a good thing, wouldn't <clears> it? Ahem. <throat> so you mentioned uh, COVID lockdown obviously slapped a bunch of theater companies in the face. Uh, how has The Bear adapted? I know you said you've been doing some things online. Were you doing performances online? Because I know Prague Shakespeare Company did a couple of performances of The Tempest oh. and other things at, on Zoom. Quite complicated. Yes, yes. It was amazing, the COVID times. Of course, I mean, our story is a very positive story compared to many things that other people had to live through. But, but we were in the middle of a tour. We were in Poland. One of our teams was in Poland and we had two days in the same school and we played the first day and we had to go home before the second day. It was that sudden. Uh, but we were kind of almost suddenly we were behind the game because our the whole point of the bear is it, it's bringing in-person entertainment into school. So right. it's just us. There's no technology. There's nothing. There's not even lights. There's, we don't even get blackout. Mm. And it's very much about yeah people being able to entertain other people by just standing up in the old style and just talking to them and mm -hmm. that, that's what the bear was always about so anti technology get off the devices that people can do that mm. but then of course suddenly we had to go online <laughs> and right. we were so we were so far behind the game and um, so we were really fumbling and we were behind the teachers the teachers were online of course having to teach I and mean, they had to they those mm -hmm. those thrown in the water and they just had to do it so they were ahead of us by the time I got to being online. Mm. So that first period from March to the summer, we were just playing around and um, trying to do stuff, but it was so difficult. The sound quality, of course, then the lighting, and the other, so much technical stuff, which is why I'm not interested in making film. It's just so technical, technical. Mm -hmm. So we were fumbling around with that for a while. But then after the summer break, um, I got to work with Luca, who works in the Prague Film School. He joined our group and he, we had a wonderful relationship with him. Mm -hmm. And we've created now what I think is a very good quality online program. Yes. So, yeah, we, we're playing through Zoom and we're playing in the Chayovna in Prague 6 in their downstairs space. Uh, that, that, so people know that's Amazing Chayovna. Amazing Chayovna, yeah. Been around for ages. And they supported us to the hilt. And we gave them money mm -hmm. when we had it and when we didn't. They're like, no, carry on. Just you carry on doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so we're playing in front of a green screen. We've got a big green curtain hanging ah. up on the wall. And we're playing Sherlock. We've got four of our shows adapted for online. And there's a big story how we managed to adapt it. Mm. Um, but we're, the feedback we got from that, we're playing yeah, Sherlock Holmes. I'll be Dr. Watson saying, come up, let's go and see Sherlock Holmes in front of a, an image of the outside of Sherlock Holmes's house. Sure. Then we cut, use a little film clip to cover the scene change. Mm -hmm. And then Sherlock Holmes is in his house welcoming Dr. Watson in. Ah. And so we've got a whole, and it's interactive, and the students can get into breakout rooms to discuss the, the case, can like write into the chat their ideas, and the actors can refer to that as it goes. So for me, online, the online program has been fantastic. And we will play, we were playing shows for mixed groups from Greece and Poland at the same time, and the Ukraine, and we played for Belarus. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I really hope that we can keep that program going. The problem is the resistance from teachers who have, even though this, everybody who saw it gave it the best feedback I've ever had for anything. Right, it's like the life. very concept is anathema. To we don't, we don't want online. Teachers. We don't want online. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we are at the moment with that. Um, yeah, so we've, I'm very, very proud of the online program we created. I think it's the best quality teaching I've ever done. It's the most interesting mm. ways of telling stories I could possibly think of. The interactive possibilities are immense, mm. and nobody wants it. It's nobody. And when I say nobody, I mean all of the thousands of people who have known us for years and years Not don't want to even try it for free. 
Really? Yeah, it was an, an incredible. Just, uh, we, we smacked our head against that brick wall several times. And um, I'm, I'm going to try again. Well, I'm going to have to now. COVID's back. We can't play in person. So yeah, that's just right. <laughs> but that's, yeah. that's what I'm going to do this evening. I mean, that's kind of what you're doing. You're, you're in, in many ways, you're creating a product. Hmm. And then once it's created, it's not hard to, you know, we say mount a production, but especially with this online type stuff, it's not hard to just do it again. Yeah, absolutely. Here it is, chunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know? No, and, and, and Luca from the film school, he made some wonderful just image because, because I'm not a visual person. I want to mm -hmm. tell stories. But when you get online, you do, it is film. So you do need a certain amount of mm -hmm. precision and mm -hmm. the lighting does have to be right and the camera has to be good enough and the sound has to be good enough. Mm -hmm. I, the stuff I was doing just wasn't professional looking and he, so he makes it look good. I tell the story well, off we go. But we don't because nobody wants it. I, so basically, the COVID time was very positive in that sense. I was going to say, have, it was kind of, kind of a boon for you in some ways. It, I, and I think it will be in time. So now we have the in-person program, which is still very popular, and, and there's no limit to that, really. And the online program, which potentially could cover the world. I mean, there's no, there's no yeah. way you can't play online. And, and the way we're seeing the online program at the moment, is it's like the early days of alcohol-free beer, we're thinking. It's just like, <laughs> we say, online theatre, well, that's a stupid idea, isn't it? We're not, we're not going to pay money for that. And actually, it's fantastic, but nobody would even think it's fantastic. And then when we did it for free, the teachers saw it and they said, oh, this is fantastic. But then they can't, they have to sell it to their directors I mean, and the yeah. parents of the students. Right. And they're saying, well, that's a stupid idea. So I won't even watch it. Yeah. How dare you? Exactly. Yeah. So we're thinking, but it's like alcohol-free beer. It's, if you think about it as a replacement for theater, then maybe it is quite miserable. If you think about it as a replacement for an English lesson, Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. It's or, or as a brand new thing. As a brand new thing, exactly. Uh -huh. And I think that's what happened with alcohol-free beer. When people think, well, it's nothing like beer. I'm not going to get drunk on that. But if you start thinking of it as something you can have with your lunch instead of, instead of Coke, mm -hmm. then you think, oh, maybe that's oh, maybe not such a bad idea after all. Yeah. And, but it took about five or six years for that. Sure, sure. And a lot of, and a lot of marketing and advertising for the public to, Absolutely. to make that switch. So it, it, the only frustrating thing about it is um, partly this, yeah, this feeling of, New things happen, you adapt, you change, and that's your way to success. And like, we did it, we adapted, we changed, we made a brilliant product. Do you think some of these techniques, a sort of blending of technologies, will inform the in-person productions in the future? Do you think, I, hey, we could have a big screen TV or even a projection screen or something up there? I mean, obviously, it's more mm. to carry. I don't, I don't think so, because I think the whole... The, the, the charm of what we're doing in person mm -hmm. is uh, exactly like I said before. I've just I've whittled down to the bare bones of telling the story, and I don't. I mean, other theatre companies will play for schools, and but they are theatre companies. They're not educators. They right, don't understand right. what the essence of is needed for them. So they'll come along and they will charge twice as much as us. Right. But I'm looking at that and I think, yeah, but you're charging because you've got equity actors staying in hotels. Right. And you've got technician. A, a technician yeah, yeah, yeah. and you've got lighting. Mm -hmm. And so that you're getting these students to pay for all of that stuff, which mm -hmm. isn't helping tell the story at all, or even helping to entertain them that much, to be honest. Mm. So I yeah, no, I I think if we're playing live we're gonna be just hanging out in front of a curtain. Back to back to bare bones. That's what that's what it is, and that's how it works, and that's the uh, charm of it. But the nice thing about being online is that you can use the visual effects. You can mm -hmm. have stuff happening there. You almost need to to make the medium work at all. But it's still kind of interesting because we're. I mean, I mean, Lucas. I'm saying, oh, I don't want to get in the technology and all the rest of it. And he made the point, and he's quite right, that what we're doing, it's still very low tech compared to everything else that's happening online on a screen. A lot of the charm of, the, of what we're doing is it is live. Mm -hmm. So even though we're in Prague and they are in the Ukraine, we are still doing it for them live in right. that moment. We are there because they wanted to see us. And for me, that's what's unique about what we're ah, doing. And I think that's, on the hook, if you want, but that's also what we want to do. Like, if they write a, a question, right? Why didn't Sherlock Holmes do that? We can write back in real time. Mm. But for me, being live is still a big part of it, and it's still mm -hmm. live actors mm. performing for people live, even though it's going through Zoom. Don't forget to check the episode notes for links to the bear and a bunch of other things that we have talked about in this episode today. Uh, this is 
Uh, this is absolutely super interesting stuff. It's 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 theater. It's education. It's uh, live. It's bare bones. It's also tech. It's a real blend of things, and it's still evolving. And I think that's. Uh, in many ways, the most interesting thing. I think a lot of people have this idea that live theater is this old-fashioned entertainment format, and in fact, it need not be. It, it is still, mm. it is very much a living mm. uh, genre and a living thing, and so why can't it evolve, right? Yeah. There's so many things you can do on a stage. Mm. It's like a blank sheet of paper, and there's different ways of engaging with people. So we're doing our shows, yeah, we're, we're, we are acting sometimes, but acting, I, I, I don't really want actors because uh, I think actors often distract from telling stories, to mm -hmm. be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you're acting, but you can also be teaching, you can also be presenting, you can also be moderating, mm -hmm. you can also be a game show host. Mm -hmm. And we're using all of these things in the show is all mixed up together. And uh, yeah, just different ways of engaging people. And I, I find it unfortunate that the old style theater where you only act is valued more highly. Well, super interesting stuff, and obviously uh, we'll see what happens uh, in the future with um, coronaviruses and who knows what else Mother Nature may throw at us. But nonetheless, uh, I wish, of course, the bear all the luck, and uh, I'm very curious to see what happens Thanks. for the next 25 years. We'll, we'll be here. I'm not going to do anything else. So <laughs> this is will it. Be, be, as long as I'm around, there'll this be something. This is David yeah. Fisher's whole life. Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. David Fisher, artistic director and founder of the Bear Educational Theater. Again, check the episode notes for links. Uh, thank you for talking to me today, David. It's been great, Derek. It's lovely. Thank you for having me. And of course, I'd like to thank everybody out there for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of Prague Times. If you liked this episode, be sure to like it or share it and tell your friends. Check us out on all of our social media platforms for extra goodies as well. Until next time, this has been Prague Times. <laughs>